crucified life out of Galatians 2.20. And then I gave a sequel to that. And then last Sunday we had Thanksgiving and I still uh, gave a sequel to Galatians 2.20 out of recognizing uh, sin in our life. And uh, I gave the definitions of sin and one of those is what we're going to look at today. But let's have a word of prayer. Father God, we want to thank you for this time and I especially want to thank you to see our sister Linda Brush back with us today. Lord, we just praise you and give a hallelujah for what you've been doing in her life and her body. And Father, I lift up uh, Diane to you today. Uh, I lift up Janet to you today and any others in, in our congregation that needs a healing touch of your grace. Father, a special move of your spirit in their lives. And Father, just continue to protect our ministry here that you have established and working through us to reach people around us. And Father, that you will continue to work in every one of our lives until we absolutely learn to surrender to your perfect will in every way. Lord, I pray the anointing of the Holy Spirit take the raiments of this word today, open up the ears of our heart to receive that engrafted word, that revelation that each one of us need. And Father, I'll be the first one to admit I need revived in my life. I need revival. Our church needs revival. Our nation needs revival. And Father, each of us need to learn what this lesson is speaking to us today, that whatever is not a faith is sin in our life, and to recognize what that is. And I just thank you for your word that gives to us the way to walk with you, how to love you and how to obey you. And we just praise you for it right now. I pray for a miracle to take place in somebody's life today that hears this. If not someone here, but somebody out on the YouTube, but wherever this message goes, that Father God, your perfect will be accomplished in somebody's life. And I thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit and the living word and what it does in us and through us to bring you pleasure. And we thank you for it in Jesus' precious and holy name. And everybody said. Amen. So, some of these quotes here that I'm going to be looking at came from Major Thomas. Uh, he had a ministry worldwide. I've got several of his books through the years. And uh, he spoke about some things that are pretty deep. And this is one of those subjects. Let me read one of his statements to you today. It says, it is not a matter of doing our best for him, but Christ being his best in us all that he is in all that we are. And when we look at this verse that the theme of this message comes from, whatever is not of faith in God is sin. Romans 14, 23b, the last part of that, with well, the first part of that verse. So how do you define, and he gives a good definition of this, how do you define in a Christian's life, whatever is not of faith is sin? Well, I began to look in my own life and in the ministry, and I find a lot of times I was not operating in faith. I was operating in self, in training, and operating in the flesh, in my old sin nature. I was trying to make my sin nature perform that which you cannot do, and that's the life of Jesus. Let me tell you something about me being here today this church being here today and you people being here today, it's not about us, it's not about the church, it's not about the ministry, it's Jesus. Anytime in ministry in your personal life you leave Jesus out, you're in sin. I don't care what you're doing. The Bible says whatever. I wanna ask you a question, what does the word whatever mean? Anything. Whatever you're doing in your life, if you're not putting faith in God in it, then why are you doing it? I'm going to tell you, I'll be frank with you about us ministers. One of the biggest problems we have is our sick, big ego. Ministry feeds an ego. That's why a lot of people are in ministry today. They got called, but not by Jesus. Because when Jesus calls you, it's his word that's doing it. It's his will doing it. It's his, 
His power doing it. His life doing it. It's all about Jesus. It's like the song we just sang, Jesus only Jesus. I'm going to tell you what we do, though. We begin to pat ourselves on the back and we, we count numbers. I'm real bad about that. That's God's business. We get to bragging about how many people get saved and how many people came into church and how many people was at this conference and how many people was at this, this retreat, this, this, this. And everything is about what you're doing in that ministry. That's idolatry. It's adultery. But most ministers do not recognize that as idolatry, but it is idolatry. Because it's the worship of self and what self can do without God. There's a lot of stuff going on today that Jesus has nothing to do with, but everybody calls it from Jesus. <laughs> uh, let me read his statement here. It's a pretty long one. He says, uh, whatever is not of faith is sin. Our activity must come from total dependence upon God. Whatever does not release God's activity through your life is sin. Re let me read that again. Whatever is not released is not releasing God's activity through your life. It is sin. It is sin because it, it stems on an attitude of independence. That makes you open to any and all of Satan's deceptions in his long history of usurping God's authority. God does not honor men and women with their deeds, their books, their gimmicks, their man-made ministries and organizations. It is only the life of the Lord Jesus, his activity clothed with you and displayed through you that ultimately will be found only in God's approval. It's Jesus that God's approved of, not you, not me, not what you're doing. That's not what God's looking for. He's looking for Jesus in you. Amen? You see, so much nowadays is the kingdom building of ministries. They're all over the world. We've got mega ministries here in America. And I just wonder how many people are really getting born again and filled with the Holy Spirit and are going out and be, being discipled to where they bring other people through Jesus to the cross. No, you know what? Everybody's talking about their ministry. They wear clothes that's got the names of their ministry on them. What are they, what are they uh, promoting? The ministry that they're involved in. They're not promoting Jesus. Do you understand what I'm saying? And I'm guilty of that too. I've been in this since 1973. 48 years, I guess it is now. And you know what? I have to admit, most of the time, it was me and not God. I can tell you so many things, and I still have to catch myself today because I get caught up in wanting to do things in the flesh because I lose my patience with God and I get ahead of God and God says, you see, that's what you can do, but let me show you what I can do. You see, if you will wait on God and surrender to him, a miracles will happen. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's real. Uh, I want to... Uh, emphasize this out of a, a display in the scriptures in Romans 8. Well, before I go to Romans 8, I got another uh, scripture the Holy Spirit gave me yesterday that I want to use before I go to Romans 8. Go to Romans 6. I was about to forget this. I want to show you an example in the Bible of people that were in sin because what the Bible says, whatever is not of faith is sin. These people here, the Pharisees, and we have modern day Pharisees today in all denominations and all ministries. I don't care what ministry you're in, there's Pharisees in it. There's always a representation of man's old nature in ministries. It's unbelievable, but it's there. And I want you to see an example of that right here. In Matthew 6, 1 to 5, take heed that you do not your alms before men. Now, alms is an old English uh, term that has to do with good deeds. He says, I warn you, don't do this for attention. You see, people who have an ego problem, who have a, an insecurity problem, and they're in ministry, they do things to get patted on the back. They want attention for it because they didn't get it as a child. But now they're in ministry and they're getting that attention and they won't pat it on the back, coddle their old nature. But Jesus says, uh-uh, don't do things for attention to be seen of people. 
Otherwise, you have no reward of your father, which is every time we brag on ourselves in ministry, that's all the reward you're getting for what you did. That's it. You just annulled any reward you would have gotten in heaven. Your rewards need to be built in heaven, not on earth. Do not ever take any credit for anything you're doing in ministry it, because it's got to be from Jesus. Otherwise, if it's not, it's flesh. It's your old sin nature doing it. We've got to watch ourselves because it's very easy to do. So he says, if you want to do that, he, he says, that's the only reward you're getting. Verse 2, therefore, when thou do your alms, do not sound the trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. You see, what they're wanting is to be praised and worshipped. It's called kingdom building. And all ministries have these people in them. Verily I say, and you, you have your reward. That's your only reward you're getting. But when thou doest the alms, when you're doing good goods of kindness and acts and charity and all these things, let not thy left hand know what the right hand is doing. Don't go around bragging about it. Let me tell you something. People in ministry, because I'm talking from myself because of my own guilt, we try to take too much credit when God's the one that gets all the credit. Now, he don't get the credit for the stuff you do in the flesh. But he gets the credit when the anointing of the Holy Spirit moves in you to do things. That's God. You can't take credit for that. That, that anointing is from God. You cannot anoint yourself. Amen? But when thou doest the alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand does. The alms may be in secret, that thy father which sees in secret himself shall reward thee openly. God will at times allow uh, that anointing to be seen by people for the purpose of not bringing attention to yourself, but to Jesus. Amen. And I think that's what he means by bringing that reward out openly. And then there's other scriptures in, in the book of uh, Matthew that talks about things the Pharisees were doing that Jesus says, uh-uh, that's not from me. That's not from the Father. That's not from God. A lot of stuff going on in denominations of ministry today is not from Jesus. Amen? Now, I want us to go to Romans 8, and I want you to see uh, the difference between the flesh and the Holy Spirit working in a, a Christian. If you were to study uh, Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 8, what you will discover is the work of sanctification. Uh, it, it's your past, your present, and your future. And you can see all that spelled out in those three chapters. But what I want to look at today is uh, the one that's talking more about the Holy Spirit and what He's doing. Now, I will admit here, in chapter 8, uh, the word flesh is mentioned 12 times. Some of that has to do with your old sin nature, and some of that has to do with the human body. And then it mentions 19 times the Holy Spirit. So there's a kind of like a battle that's going on, and uh, Paul talked about his own battle with this in uh, Romans 7. He says, how to perform that which is good I find not. He says, how in the world can I get a solution to this? I thank God it's through Jesus. And so in Romans 8, he shows how the victory comes in our lives by us realizing that Jesus did away, Galatians 2.20, he nailed that flesh, that old sin nature, to the cross with him. So when he nailed our old sin nature with him to the cross, we died with him, we were buried with him, and we were resurrected with him. It's all Jesus in us. It's not about us. We can't try it. We can't perform it because it's impossible for a human being to do it. It's something from heaven. So let's look at these verses there. There is therefore now no condemnation. Now that means to try to hold someone guilty for what they've done to those that are in Christ Jesus. Now the word in Christ Jesus has to do with those who have been born again, those who are truly saved, true believers. They're in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. 
And you'll find that mentioned also down in verse 4. Some people believe that some of the transcribers took part of verse 4 and put up verse 1. But it all has to do with the same theme is you're either going to walk in the flesh in this world or you're going to walk in the spirit. I have to admit to you, most of our life, we're walking after the sin nature and not after the Holy Spirit. Does anybody believe that? Most of the time. It's sad. We rob God of his due in our lives because we're bought by the blood of Jesus. And we rob ourselves of the benefits of all that God wants us to have. But we rob ourselves, we rob God because we choose to walk in the flesh most of our life. You know why? We have our daily routines. We have our habits and we got things that we say we got to do. I want to ask you a question. Who says you got to do it? <laughs> you could be dead before tomorrow. Who says you got to do all that you say you got to do? How much of what you got to do is an act of faith in God instead of the act of faith in your flesh, your old sin nature? There is therefore now no condemnation of those that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. See, there's a new law, there's a new principle. When we got born again, we now live under a new law, the law of love, the law of obedient faith in Jesus. And so he's freed us from the law of sin. The, your sin nature says all you can do is sin. That's true. When you're not saved, all you're going to do is sin. That's what the old sin nature does. That's Lucifer in the Garden of Eden transferred into mankind. And we have that nature in our old nature. It's Lucifer, the devil. But Jesus has freed us also from the condemnation of the, the law of the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments. You know what it does? It shows you what sin is, that you're a sinner and that you've broken God's law, that you went and transgressed God's holy law and you did it willfully because you wanted to. It brought you comfort and pleasure to be sinful. That's the way we are sinners. But we live under a new law now. The, the law that has set us free is the law of Christ. We live in a freedom now because we're born again. We have Jesus in us. We have a new destiny, a new life. Everything about us should be new. If it's not, you've never been saved. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that you're a changed person. You're a new creature, a new creation. Because the old is passed away, behold, all things become new. That's because there's a new heavenly life living in us. So that's what verse 2 is talking about. Verse 3 says, For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh. You see, the law could not save you. It cannot take you to heaven. It cannot conform you. It cannot change you. Jesus has done that with his life coming in us and invading every area of our life. So Jesus is, did something that nobody else could do. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. That's why Jesus was birthed. That's why we celebrate Christmas. He had to have a body to be sacrificed for God and for us so that the sin problem could be dealt with. And Jesus lived in that body for 33 years. And he died. In the death that he died, he died for God and he died for us. That's enough right there to want to live for Jesus. Right there. But no, our attention is on the life in this world most of the time. And we get mad at people and God and one another when our life routine is messed up. Do you know what? God knows how to mess your life up for his glory and his honor. Some of us are in for some hard breaking, some crucifying. Because we still have not surrendered our will to Jesus. And we fight God, we fight one another because we don't want to surrender. We want to keep doing what we want to do. That means you are a God. You're worshiping self-love. You're worshiping self, not Jesus. Quit lying to everybody and to God himself and thinking you can sit in the church and everything's going to be okay. No. Life's out here in the world. Letting Jesus be God and Lord in your life, not you with your silly routines. 
your worldliness. That does nothing but bring shame on the kingdom of God in the blood of Jesus. And we know better because we're born again saved people. We're just not spirit filled. Oh, we think we are sometimes. But you know what? People that know you, they know where you are with God. It comes out your mouth and out of your attitude. Isn't that right? That woman right there, I may be married to her 56 years in January. She knows me better than, well, not better than God does. God knows me better. But she's the only one that knows me better than God. You know why? I live with her and she lives with me. She knows when I'm a hypocrite and when I'm spirit-filled. She knows the difference immediately. She can tell you. Isn't that right? <laughs> uh, now look at uh, verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Now, what does that mean? The mind means to set your attitude and your mind on it. When you set your mind on what you want to do in your fleshy life, you don't like to be disturbed. You want to go on and complete that out. The scripture says, for they that are after the flesh do mind, they set their mind on what? Self-love. You might as well put that there in the margin of your Bible because to mind self is to mind self-love. You're worshiping yourself. And you're going to do the things of the flesh of your old sin nature of the world. You see, you're, you're obeying the authority of a law of the sin nature, which is from Lucifer. Instead of obeying the authority of the law of God through the word of God, of living for him, letting Jesus be Lord and life in you flowing out of you. For the things of the flesh, but they that are after or have their mind set on the Holy Spirit, then the, the things, they're going to choose and pursue the things of the Holy Spirit. And what is he going to do? He's going to reveal Christ in you and through you. So it's obedient faith to the authority of God's word. That's what God is after. That's what the Holy Spirit is after. Then in verse 6, for to be carnally minded, the word carnal means of the world or of your five natural senses, living naturally. I want to ask you a question. Does the Bible tell us as Christians to live just the natural life? It says the just shall live by faith. You see, the faith is going to affect your natural life. Remember the text, whatever is done that has no faith in God, it is sin. That's what the scripture says. To, to be carnally minded is death. Question, if you decide one day I'm going to live to please my flesh life and my self-love, the Bible just gave us a sentence of death on that day. What does the word death mean? It's not just to die uh, physically or spiritually. It's to have uh, destruction and, and uh, uh, well, I'm going to give you an illustration of that. The other day I was listening to Tony Evans and he used a, a, a fruit as an example of what I'm talking about. When a fruit gets a piece of decay or rot on it, What's going to happen to the rest of that fruit? It's going to continue to rot. Just like rotten wood. You know what I tried? It's so stupid what I did. Sometimes us men, we think we're doing things right and sometimes we're just not. <laughs> I thought I could take some of this, this uh, putty that's made of plastic and stuff, you know, and, and I could cover this piece of rotten wood up and I would make that wood stronger. <laughs> Isn't that ridiculous? What happened? That wood still rotted, and what I put on it was absolutely worthless, a waste of money and time. When something is rotten, you got to get rid of it. It's no good. Well, in the Christian life, when something is rotten, death's on it, decays on it, what do you got to do? You got to get rid of it. It's not any good. So that's what it, it talks about in Galatians 20, is crucifying that stuff in our life that is decayed and rotten, 
and is full of destruction and no good. It's the old self-life. It's got to be crucified out of us. And God's going to take you through some tests and trials to break you, to mold you, to make you into to what Jesus wants you to be, and it's to be just like him, reflecting his image and not yours. Hello? And you know what we do? We fight God. We fight him because we don't want to change. Amen? One of the first things that a young couple does when they get married, they've got it in their mind. The man and the woman says, I'm going to change them. Oh, brother, the war's on. <laughs> it's going to be a war. You can't change anybody. Only God can change people. Amen? You better learn to love and forgive. That's the way it works in the Christian life. That's the way the cross works. Love and forgive. You can't leave that out. That's the Christian life. That's Jesus. So in verse 6, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. What is that? That's the life of Jesus, the peace of Jesus. It's himself and you uh, living his life through you when you surrender to it. Not you trying and not you performing because that won't work. He says in verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity, it is hostile to God, it's an enemy to God. It is not subject to the law of God, and neither indeed can be. You see, the natural mind cannot understand the things of God, and it will not obey the laws of God. Because the inclination in your old sin nature is to sin, because you're a sinner. And that's what happens. People think, well, I can join a church, get baptized in the church, you know, and become a Christian. That don't make you a Christian. You're not going to change. What makes you a Christian? When you get, let Jesus come in your heart, come in your life, to be your actual Savior and your actual Lord, and not to play church. People not born again sitting in church, they're just playing church. Well, he says in verse 8, he, he, he says it right here. So those that are in the flesh, underline this in your Bible, cannot please God, period. You can't perform it. You can't try harder. The Bible says when you're in the flesh, if you're lost, you're totally in the flesh all the time. But as a Christian, you go in and out of the flesh, the carnal life. You get, we're like a schizophrenic. Sometimes we're up, sometimes we're down. Sometimes we're walking in the Spirit of God, and sometimes we're walking in the Spirit of the devil. And whichever way you've surrendered to, whatever authority you've surrendered to, that's what's coming out your mouth, out of your attitudes, and out of your life. One of those kingdom authority or the other is going to come out. Can anybody say amen? amen? It's the truth. So, verse 9, but you are not in the flesh. Now he's talking to the Christian. But in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is not of him. He's not a Christian. The Bible said that. I didn't say that. The Bible just said that. Look at it again. If any man have not the Holy Spirit of Christ, that person is not of Jesus. He's not a Christian. He's not in the family of God. He may be a church member, but he's not been saved. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because uh, of righteousness. Now I think he's talking about your human body because your human body became uh, an instrument of the devil instead of instrument of God. But once you become a born again person, then it becomes an instrument of God. But we make the choice every day of how our body's going to be used. Amen? And let me tell you what we try to do. We try to blame somebody else for what we're doing with our body. How stupid. I think Adam did that with Eve, didn't he? <laughs> did it work? No. God didn't accept that excuse. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit which dwells in you. And he's talking about the Holy Spirit, when you get born again, anoints your body. 
And that anointing, even after you're dead, is still there because that body someday is going to be resurrected and you're going to get a body just like Jesus has, a resurrected body. That's going to happen someday. Therefore, brethren, now he's getting a little deeper he's in his dissertation with them, with these Romans. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh. You do not owe your old sin nature one thing but death. That's what Jesus did with it on the cross, and that's what we have to do with it every day. You see, your sin nature um, only becomes alive in you when you surrender to it. Because Jesus annulled it. He put the death sentence on it. But what do we do? We're so stupid. We resurrect it. Every time we use our mind, some satanic, the demonic thought, some thing from the flesh, we decide, I'm going to do this and this and this. Well, there's the problem. I. I. That's self-love. That's yourself being an idol, yourself being a god. I'm going to tell you something. God hates that. He hates idolatry. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, but to, to, to live after the flesh. For we live after the flesh, you shall die. But if through the Holy Spirit you do mortify the deeds of the body. Mortify. The Greek word morti there has to do with death. That's where we get the word mortician from. Mortician are people who handle dead people. They handle people that have died. It's death. So what is he saying? Mortify the deeds of your body. Our bodies have cravings and desires that works on the mind. For instance, this Thanksgiving, there were foods that our body did not need. But we love it. We love the taste. Amen? There are certain things around holidays, mmm, I love that spice in my coffee, that pumpkin spice, and they only sell it seasonally, but it sure tastes good, but it's got stuff in it that you don't need. Amen? So what do I have to do? Do I decide to go on and indulge and gratify my flesh, or do I say, no, my body's the temple of the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to put the right things in my body and honor God with my body. Do we do that? No. Why? Because we are Americans. We like comfort food, which someday may, may be hard to find the way things are going. <laughs> uh, now, I'm going to close with this verse 14 here. For as many as are led by the Holy Spirit of God. They are the sons of God. These are the true Christians. Those who are being led by the Holy Spirit are real Christians. Now, I just want to reiterate something here in John 5, 19, in your bulletin there in John 15, 5. I've used these in the last few weeks to reiterate the problem we have with self. Jesus said in John 5, 19, the son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father doing. I want to ask you a question. If Jesus said that about himself and he lives in us, why aren't we saying that about ourselves? Jesus said, I can do nothing but what the father wants me to do. I want to ask you a question. Why can't you and I say that and confess that to the Lord? I can do nothing but what the Father God wants me to do. I'm going to tell you why we don't say that very much. Because we don't want to. Because self is predominant. If you're honest, most of the time self is predominant in our life. Jesus should be. He said in John 15, 5, Without me, you can do nothing. Activity in the Christian life is the life of Jesus, not you performing or trying. 
And a lot of times we don't even do that because we're so busy living in the flesh, we don't have time for God. How many people want to hear that? Now, I want to reiterate this whole thing around this statement, which is, I believe, a command. Whatever is not done in faith in your life towards God is sin to God. Whatever. Amen? All the stuff that we go through and we complain and gripe and fight and do all kinds of stuff with God and with one another. What for? You're trying to keep the kingdom of self alive. Let me tell you, God's got one goal. One goal for the kingdom of self and that's to kill it. To crucify it. To deaden it. Because it's not pleasing to God, it's not pleasing to anybody else. Amen. Nobody wants to see the junk coming out of your life. They see that out in the world enough. They need to see that we're pure and, and we've got a clear conscience and we've got the Holy Spirit dwelling, living us, filling us. They want to see God in our lives, not the junk. Amen. Did you know, I believe, that if every one of us was so filled with God, and so willing to be out in the community, winning people to Christ, these pews would not be empty today. You know, we're approaching a new year, <clears throat> and I, I'm thinking about this. How is this church going to survive? Financially, how is it going to survive? How is it going to survive without people? It could wind up being like a lot of other churches, dying on the vine. Because the people in it have got to care about keeping it going and be filled with the Holy Spirit instead of the junk that's in their life. But until we're willing to let God break us and mold us and give us revival, we're never going to do anything for God in this church. It's going to sit here and die. I don't want to see that happen. I'm a funeral director, and I sure don't want to have a funeral of a church. I don't want to see a church die that I have been putting my heart and blood in in may it'll be 20 years. I don't want to see that. You know the ones that can change that is you. I am one giving the word to the people. But unless the word is going out of here to the world, what good are we doing? What's the reason for us existing if we're not winning people to Christ? Amen? I need revival. I need God's strength. And so do you. Until we admit that we need all of God and none of self. John the Baptist said that, he said, I must decrease so that Jesus can increase. And that should be in our heart. Amen? Father God, I want to thank you, Lord, for the sh letting me share with you this deeper life scripture that whatever is not a faith in you is sinful. Because, Father, we ministers, we Christians, most of the time do not recognize that that verse exists. We live as if it doesn't exist. But whatever is done in our lives that's not faith in you, it is sin. You said it in your word. You will not accept it. You will not approve of it. Because it's flesh. It's the old sin coming from the kingdom of darkness. Father, our whole congregation needs a breaking in their lives me and my wife we need the beginning of it as well or we're never going to become what we're supposed to be in this world as individuals and as a local ministry and lord god i pray you would just continue to break those ministers that are out there bragging on themselves and bragging on their ministries and that's all you hear about is what they're doing in their ministry and nothing about jesus that is idolatry. And Father, you're the only one that can do anything about it to get people to repent, to stop that activity that's not coming from faith. Faith in what they're doing instead of faith in you is idolatry. 
And Lord God, how I, I recognize that. I've done it so much. I don't know how you put up with me. I just thank you for your grace and love and patience, which I can't explain. So Father, with our heads bowed and eyes closed, it's time to do some serious business with you. Father, right here today, every one of us need a revival. Every one of us need to confess sin. Every one of us need to confess things that we're doing that we thought was from Jesus it wasn't from Jesus, it was from us because we wanted the attention for it. We wanted the bragging rights. And Lord, that is a sin that is horrible against you because you hate idol worshipers. And that's what that is. So Father, break us and mold us and make us as individuals, as families, into what you want us to be. It's all about Jesus and nothing else. That every time something goes on in our life, it needs to be faith in the Lord, and not faith in what we're doing. Father, most of the time we don't recognize it. We don't look for it. Help us in these last days to have discernment, to look, to make sure we're doing things that you have given permission, that you have anointed, and not us. So, Lord, I just pray for confession. I confess right now, Lord, I'm guilty. I confess right now, Lord, that I need to repent of doing things in the flesh. Lord, just like I cannot keep this ministry going, I cannot keep these people coming here, I cannot keep the offerings coming in, I can't do none of that. Lord, only your spirit through the life of Jesus will work. Nothing else will work. So Lord, help us to, to realize, to totally surrender, to quit holding on to self-love. And we do it even in ministry. Oh, God, it is so awful that we profane your name in blood, being in ministry doing it. But nobody recognizes that. But, Lord, you said you can't approve of it. You will not approve of it. Because you said no flesh will glory in your presence. And you meant it. So, Father, I pray for mercy. Mercy for all those in ministry in this country, all the Christians. Lord, we need a dose of conviction, a dose of repentance to become what we're supposed to be or we're going to be completely losing this country and we will not be able to win more people to Christ because your judgment will fall like a hammer and that'll be it. So, Father, we're crying out for mercy today. Help us while there's time left to reach more lost people and bring them to church. Bring them to be discipled so that they can know what Jesus is all about and share Jesus themselves out in the world. And thank you for the privilege. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, you right now know if there's sin in your life right where you're sitting. You know right now that your conscience is bothered and guilty and, and full of that convicting power of the Holy Spirit. And he's bothering you and bothering you and bothering you and you're fighting him. When are you going to stop that fighting? You can't fight God and win. Why don't you surrender today? Why don't you give it all to him? Let him have everything, all your problems, all the stuff you're going through. Give it to Jesus. He knows how to work it out. And you're killing yourself trying to, to live the Christian life on your own power. It's impossible. You need anointed. You need the movement of God. You need the Holy Spirit to move on you in every area of your life. And all those secret little sins you got hidden down in your heart, you need to cough them up. And let Jesus have them. He died on the cross for them. Quit holding on to them. Quit being a prisoner to things you're saying and what you're doing in your past. Quit it. Stop the flesh working. Stop it. And let Jesus have his way right now. Let him have his way right now. Let go and let him have his way. Father, I pray. I beg, Lord, for miracles 
and all of our people in this church, all of our family members. Lord, everybody needs a heavenly touch. Lord, without you, we can't do nothing. We are nothing. We don't have a future without you. Lord, I beg of you to let us have that anointed, the power of the Holy Spirit to be a true witness, not a hypocrite, not riding in two fences and one foot in the world, one foot in heaven. It don't work. Help us to be true and truly committed, not half-hearted, but totally committed. And Father, I ask for breaking. I ask for test and crisis and molding in people's lives until you get your way. And that includes me and my wife, my family. Because Father, all that counts in the long run is what did we do for Jesus? What did we allow Jesus to do through us that others can be in heaven with us? Instead of us playing games with you and playing games in a ministry in church, but being real. Lord God, we need some reality of Jesus in our life. But Father, I can't perform it. I can't do it. You have to do it with everybody's individuals. And so, Father, I'm begging you to do a miracle work in this ministry here. And I ask it in Jesus' precious and holy name. Everybody see it? Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Just needed to share my heart with you.